Well, hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to 2nd and 3rd John, where we will compare and complete one another on this difficult subject of heresy, false teachings, false teachers, and see what the apostle of love, John, has to say about it. We're starting with the greetings in 2nd John, or verse 1 to 3, which we'll compare next week and look at how he uh, greets Gaius and see where he's similar and where he adds. And with that said, let's jump right into the text, verse 1 of 1 to 3. So he starts by saying, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I loved in truth, and not only I, but all those who have known the truth. So we start with the fact that he calls himself the elder, which is why many think that is he really John? Um, well, of course, in none of his epistles and not even in his gospel does he specifically name himself. It doesn't take away that it's still the Holy Spirit that's speaking to us. And at this point in his life, he would have been an elder, probably even one of the last disciples, uh, uh, apostles still alive at this point. Some uh, say that the date of this book is probably around 95. Others push it by a little bit more to 75 after Christ. But either way, the guy would have been pretty old. And like I said, probably the last apostle still alive. So he can really call himself the elder. Also, like I said, elect Kyria or lady. Some will say this is the name of a person, just like in 3 John. Others, like myself, say no, he's talking to the church in imagery, in a metaphorical way. Now, before we say, why would he do that? I would, again, push you back to the gospel, where he presents himself as the disciple Jesus loves. Or even in 1 John, we don't even know who he's actually writing to. He never mentions the church itself. And even talks at some point up to uh, young men, uh, fathers, and children. Now, some think it's three different groups, but when you read what he says, he's saying pretty much the same thing to all three groups. And he's saying things that all three should know. So I don't think he's actually separating three groups. He's just using imagery. He's just being poetic. And I think he's doing the same thing here. Now, the only thing that will change is how we apply it, but the thing at the end of the day is we still apply the fact that he is writing for the greater good of the community of God, for the church back then and here and now. We have to understand he's not just talking to one person, even if he is talking to Akiria about her family, but he's still talking to the church in general. Just like when he talks to Gaius, well, still, he's not just talking to Gaius about himself, but about the church. We saw the same thing with Philemon. This isn't just about some guy and his runaway slave, but it's about how his application of the gospel, forgiveness, and restoration will speak to the rest of the church around him. So we have to understand it here in the same way. Whoever Kyria was, it's still something that's for the entire church. With that said, we, can, we could see her children as, again, the people in the church. Whom I love in truth. Now the word truth here actually has more of an idea of honesty, sincerity, truly, if you will. I really love them. Compared to when he gets to the end, he says that not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Now we understand there, he's talking about biblical truth, doctrine, theology, commandments, the revealed truth of God. So he's using two types of truth here and showing them how they kind of complete each other, right? It, in, it's about knowing the truth, what God has revealed, but it's also about living it out in an honest and true way. In other words, this notion some people have about head and heart knowledge and the distinction between the two isn't a biblical concept. Because when you really receive the word of God, it renews your very inner being, your inner man, if you will, the new man, and he's transformed. It might take more time to transform, but there's no such thing as a distinction between I get head knowledge now, and maybe later I'll get some heart knowledge. No, it, it, it comes together. There's no distinction. So that's why he's talking about, I love you sincerely, honestly, and truly from my heart and according to the truth of gospel. 
Now don't miss that he says all those who have known the truth, reminding us that he's not just talking to Kiria and her children, even if it is an actual person, he is talking about the reality of the church itself. The Christians, the community, the invisible church is supposed to embrace truth, what God has revealed. He then adds to that in verse 2, because, don't miss that, because of the truth which abide in us and will be with us forever. Because of this truth, this body of teaching, this revealed truth that is in us, like I said, it's not just about understanding things, it is about how it changes us as well. The change might take more time for some, but this truth abides in us, it lives in us, it takes over us, and it will be with us forever. I can't help but see in this the notion that it, it can't just be about having certain positions, doctrinal positions, and it will argue certain positions. It has to be truth that will be for us when we enter into the New Jerusalem or into heaven, if you prefer. It's forever truth. In other words, it can't just be about trying to really figure out eschatology, is it this, that, or the other, but about understanding that sin will explode, God judges will come, and Christ will rule. That's the forever truth. Sin will be destroyed, God will rule forever. Forever truth. All truth is supposed to change us in a way that will bring us into the eternal kingdom where it's just about being with God. Or if you prefer, think of the Sermon on the Mount where there's a lot going on in that sermon. But one thing we can't miss is he's teaching about what it is to be part of the kingdom. About being you know, born again and even more about um, what it's going to be like when we enter this new kingdom, this new Jerusalem, where Christ the King will be uh, living there with us. Because it's forever truth. There's no distinction that we shouldn't separate this either. Biblical truth doesn't change the way you live and only gives you arguments to debate. Well, then it's not biblical truth. Biblical truth changes us. It's something that remains with us Forever. Don't forget that. He then adds, of course, a benediction, like Paul does, and says in verse 3, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. There's a lot going on here, brothers and sisters. Um, first of all, he adds a little trifecta. It's not just grace and peace, like Paul would say, he adds mercy. Now, Paul will say grace, mercy, and peace to Timothy and Titus. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's just a, a reminder that this is what God gives us, grace, mercy, peace. It's a, uh, a bit like some of the, the founding box of what this relationship of God with us. A bit like the other three that he presents Paul many times of love, faith, and hope. The three pieces that we have before God. God before us, grace, mercy, peace. Us before God, faith, hope, and love. And of course, among ourselves. But these are just like founding blocks. They're not better than other things. It's just, it's part of this relationship with God. We need His grace, His mercy, and His peace. It's from the Father but also the Son, because they're too distinct. Yet he does remind us that the Son is the Son of the Father. And like the Son said himself, me and the Father are one. So there's a distinction and there's a unity, and it's it's crammed into that simple phrase, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. The same way we cannot separate that last little phrase, in truth and love, they go together. They're unseparable. The same with the Father and the Son is distinct, but also unseparable. He is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Truth and love can't be distinct, which is why it can be dangerous when all we say is the only important thing as Christians is to love each other according to truth. 
according to what scripture calls love. And there's a lot in the Bible that tells us what love is. We have commandments that teach us what love is. We also have sins that show us what we cannot do out of love. But we can't act among ourselves or even before God out of love. Truth and love can't be separate. You can't just say, we just love each other, man. No. We have to love according to truth. According to what God has revealed is actual love. The same way you can't just have truth that doesn't change you. Or this, again, so-called head knowledge. It's inseparable. Don't miss that. The same way in God, truth and love cannot be separated. He's a full being. There's no distinction or division in God. He's not a bit love sometimes and a bit truth sometimes. He is fully truth and fully love and fully holy and so forth and so on. And so for us, it's the same thing. You cannot separate truth and love. The same way you can't separate this idea of honestly loving each other and biblically loving each other. You can't separate the fact that this truth changes us in, to the way of, uh, to the point of it's forever. This is the, just the greetings. But this is, this is the foundation John is laying out for Kyria, for this elect lady, which he's going to get at later as we get there. But hold on to that. Hold on to this inseparable reality of truth and love, of truth that changes us forever. And with that said, be blessed and see you next time, brothers and sisters.